I'm Karen Gillenwater. I'm the museum manager for 21C Museum Hotel Louisville. And I'm really thrilled to um, be playing host this evening for this panel. I'm really excited about the conversation and appreciate you all joining us for this event. Um, I wanna start off by thanking our par partners for the ballot box exhibit, um, Skylar Smith who curated the exhibit and Keith Waits and Christian Anderson from Louisville Visual Art. Um, along with um, uh, Sarah Lindgren from Metro um, Public Art Administrator, because of course the exhibit started at Metro Hall and so she was part of helping us um, shift it to host at 21C. Um, and then of course I wanna thank our panelists for um, being here this evening. Uh, we have Representative Charles Booker, Dejan Graves, Daniel Martin Moore and Jalen Stewart. So um, before we get into the conversation though, as I mentioned, we wanna start with sharing a little bit about the ballot box exhibit. Um, this was an LVA exhibit that was curated by Skylar Smith for Metro Hall. And personally, I had the privilege of being a part of it um, in a small way from the very beginning by being a part of the advisory committee um, and working with Skylar on organizing things, which was a real pleasure. And then, of course, after um, the pandemic hit, Metro Hall continued to be closed so that um, people weren't able to see the exhibit where it was installed there. Um, we were able to move it to 21C Louisville to host it there so we could provide a space so that the public could come in and see it. Um, and it's been there since the beginning of September. We've had um, quite a few people come through and you'll have a, a few more weeks, um, another about six weeks really, to get in and see the exhibit if you haven't been there yet. Um, it's a really fabulous exhibit. Um, I really feel like there's a power in how the artists um, tell these personal and communal stories through their works. And each of them really presents a very unique approach to sharing the importance of voting rights and the ways that the injustices um, within the system negatively impact all of us. Um, so I wanna first turn it over to um, Skylar, who is an artist herself and curated this exhibit to tell you all a bit about it. And I'm gonna do some screen sharing so that you can see some images of it while she talks about it. So Skylar, I will turn it over to you and I will get the PowerPoint pulled up here. Okay. Um, well, thank you so much, Karen. And, um, and I also wanna thank um, Kentucky Foundation for Women and Louisville Visual Art and uh, Louisville Metro Public Art and 21C um, and Great Meadows Foundation. For, I mean, um, um, all these organizations and individuals at the organizations that have really helped make this um, exhibit possible. Thank you so much. Um, can you can you hear me okay? Is this good? Am I good? Okay. Um, so uh, this is uh, Karen has put together this PowerPoint. You can see the exhibit. This is at twenty one C, and we have uh, five artists that made new work for Ballot Box: uh, Sandra Charles, Brianna Harlan, Jennifer Maravillas, Taylor Sanders, and James Rob. Robert Southard. Some of them are, are with us tonight, which is so exciting. Um, so uh, we're just going to go through the work in the show, and I'm going to say a little bit about each piece and um, try not to take up too much time from the panel. But um, if you could go to the next slide, um, Karen, that'd be great. Um, so we have, um, I think the next slide will just show. So the exhibit is in two different galleries. Um, and um, this work is by Sandra Charles. These are three life-size um, oil paintings um, that represent three um, different generations of African-American women um, standing in line uh, voting. Um, and you know, this is a really powerful piece. Um, and Sandra has used um, you know, different models uh, from her own family for these figures. Um, and the last, I think we have some details um, of each of the paintings. Um, you want to see, yes, it's here. Um, so this figure, um, the, the next figure, um, and then the last one, um, I believe the last one in the series, I think her, her title is Her Vote, the last one, Karen, um, with the youngest figure. Yes, um, I believe, um, Sandra's granddaughter was the, the model for, um, for this piece. And um, each figure you can really see in there, um, their clothing, their expression, even their stance, um, a very different attitude. 
Um, and I think Sandra was relating sort of that attitude to um, um, how that particular generation might view voting or the democratic system. Um, so we can go on to the next um, piece, um, which is uh, Brianna Harlan, um, you sang off key. So this is an installation um, based on um, Brianna's grandmother, uh, Maddie Jones, um, who is a civil rights icon, um, lives here in, in Louisville. And um, there's three panels. And the first panel tells a story of, um, that happened to Maddie Jones. And you know she related the story to Brianna um, about how she tried to vote in 1950 in Mississippi. Um, she was given a literacy test, she passed the test, but she was still denied the right to vote. Um, and um, the panels kind of moved through. Um, so Mrs. Jones portraits in the, the panel in the middle, in the center. And then we have, um, you know, she went on to become a civil rights activist, social justice activist. Um, and here we have a, a decommissioned ballot box, part of the installation, um, wrapped in old and new chains. Um, the ballot box is both, you know, closed and open, kind of showing the progress that we've made with voting rights, but there's still a lot of work to do and the vote is still not accessible um, for all. And then um, the next piece we have, um, this is a large map. Um, I believe it's about four feet by 10 feet um, by the artist Jennifer Maravilla. So this is called Party Line. And Jennifer has used um, different data sets um, to, and she's represented that data visually through color um, to show read districting and gerrymandering um, throughout the United States um, in elections over the past 10 years. And there's actually a color code um, that's displayed next to this big map um, where you can see you know, how she's translated this data into um, you know, visual information. Um, you know, and this painting is, um, it kind of lures you in with the bright colors and the textures and then you realize that you're learning about gerrymandering and, you know, these things that, you know, um, are still occurring in our voting process. Um, so if you visit the exhibit, you can um, kind of decode the colors um, to learn more about that. Um, and then the next piece, I believe is Taylor Sanders. So Taylor is the youngest artist in, in Ballot Box. I think she's 24, might, I might not have that right, but um, Taylor created two uh, sculptures for Ballot Box. This one um, is based on the prison system in, in the United States and, and the fact that inmates are not um, allowed to vote, not given the right to vote. Um, and formerly incarcerated people are also um, often prevented from voting, even though they have served their time. So um, Taylor is, is illustrating this with this kind of ghostly figure um, wearing an, an inmate uniform um, with this sticker, I was denied the right to vote. Um, and, and Taylor made a lot of these stickers for this piece. And, and her idea was that people could take a sticker and, and put, wear the sticker and kind of, um, in a way experience what it would be like to, to not have that right to vote. But due to COVID, we haven't been able to pass out the stickers, uh, but we, we have many more stickers made. Um, maybe we can share them in another way. Um, so Taylor created um, another piece, um, Guessing Game. Um, and, and this piece is very colorful. It's, it's probably the brightest piece in the show. Um, but this is based on sort of like the party game of um, guessing how many gumballs are in a jar, um, which is an impossible test to pass. Um, and Taylor is relating that um, that fun game to um, um, a literacy a literacy test, um, which is was also by design an impossible thing to pass. Um, so um, taking taking those two ideas and, and you know putting them up against each other in this piece, um, I think Taylor's done a, a really good job with um, sort of underscoring um, the the dark history of literacy tests. 
um, with this brightly colored um, party game, bringing those two things together. Um, and then we have, I think the last piece in the show. Um, so this is, a, this is a still from a video um, by James Rob, Robert Southerd, better seen than unheard. Um, so Rob, this is a two channel video. So if you go to 21C, you will see two monitors with these videos running, um, two different videos running simultaneously. And um, Rob collected um, um, footage from political campaigns I, from the past 100 years. Um, maybe he can, he can um, correct me if I'm wrong on that, but, um, uh, and he has edited out the politicians in, in all of the videos. Um, you can hear their voice, but you can't see who they are. Um, and really he was looking at the, the similar ways that politicians use imagery um, and you know, similar themes, similar tropes, um, regardless of political party to convince the public through media uh, to vote one way or another. Um, and we were able to get these videos on these public um, city post screens around downtown Louisville um, to kind of get the, the work beyond the walls of, of the gallery into the public space. And those were up for, for a little while. Um, um, they're no longer up, but, um, but yeah, please visit the exhibit so you can actually see these videos um, running. Um, oh, great, thanks, Rob. <laughs> Um, so that's just a taste of, of the exhibit. If you haven't seen it, I hope you're able to visit. It's open through March 14th. Um, and um, yeah, thank you so much. And thank you to all the artists. This is such a fabulous show and I've been so lucky um, to work with each of them. Like I said, these are all original artworks that were created specifically for Ballot Box. Thank you, sorry, I didn't unmute myself quick enough. Um, I appreciate you sharing that. Um, let me get the PowerPoint closed here so I can see you all again. There we go. All right. Um, we will send out some links to everybody who registered um, about uh, with links to the exhibition and links to um, how to make an appointment to visit the galleries at 21C. We are open seven days a week, um, a little more limited hours than our usual 24 hours. And we're just asking folks to make a reservation just to make sure that we um, don't get too many people in the galleries um, at once. So we'll be emailing out um, in the coming days, a list of, of links to some um, information to everybody who registered. Um, and if you didn't register, you don't see that, um, I am going to type my email address into the chat here and you can feel free to shoot me an email if you um, didn't uh, join us through the registration or um, you don't see that email. Um, so we'll share all that with you guys. So um, we really wanted to tie into this exhibit but also expand the conversation. Obviously the, the works in the exhibit um, address the important issue of voting rights, um, but we felt like it was important to extend the conversation to include ideas about how we can all remain engaged in the political process beyond voting and also the roles that art and culture play in creating positive change. Um, as we began the conversation, I wanted to share one thing that um, I shared and that we talked about Skylar and Keith and I when we were planning the program is that um, when we talk about um, art and culture in this sense, we're casting a really wide net. We're talking about the arts in the terms of visual art, music, poetry, um, which of course are represented here tonight, um, but also culture in the wider sense of ideas of historic traditions, regional identities and customs, language, neighborhood ties, um, our ties to um, shared spaces, things like that. So um, just something that I wanted to, to throw out there to keep in mind and um, something that really addresses um, 
part of why we pulled in the panel that we did because you guys all share um, and come from a lot of different experiences and backgrounds and work with different communities. So I think we'll have a really rich dialogue. Um, so I'm going to um, introduce our panelists and then I'm gonna kick it off with a couple of questions, but all of you who are attending, like I said, um, feel free to put your questions in the Q&A and um, I'll be checking that and asking um, those questions of our panelists as we go along too. So, um, so our wonderful panel that we've got with us tonight, um, we first have State Representative Charles Booker. Um, he grew up in the West End of Louisville and embodies the struggles facing working people across the country. As a diabetic who has had to ration insulin because of the skyrocketing cost of prescription drugs, a black man who was tear gassed protesting police violence, and someone who lived part of his life homeless, Representative Booker has personal experience with many of the deep systemic crises facing our nation. After his statewide experience as a director for the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife, using his personal story to connect with folks throughout the Commonwealth, and after seeing teachers, public employees, and minors standing up for themselves, he knew the moment was right to build a coalition from the hood to the holler. As founder and president of Hood to the Holler, Representative Booker is building this new organization to focus on the common bonds so many Kentuckians share and will help regular folks understand the power they have to transform our future, which is exactly what we're here to talk about tonight. So thank you for being with us, Representative Booker. Um, next, we have Dejan Graves. She's a digital storyteller. Uh, she uses her art to spread awareness of political issues while being a Black mother in current society. Currently, she's attending Eastern Kentucky University to obtain a degree in public administration. Dejan believes that without diverse representation, there will continue to be injustices that cause harm to Black and brown bodies. For the future, she hopes to create art that both engages, engages the mind and creates a megaphone for the voices of the unheard. Thank you for being with us tonight, Dejan. Thank you. And then next we have Daniel Martin Moore, uh, who is a musician, songwriter, and producer from Harlan County, Hardin County, Kentucky. Um, since 2008, he's released nine albums and contributed to many more by artists all over the world. His latest project, the album Pine Mountain Sessions, brought together 44 musicians and writers from across the Commonwealth to to benefit Kentucky Natural Lands Trust and the Pine Mountain Settlement School. So thank you, Daniel, for being here tonight. Um, and then last but not least, we have Jalen Stewart. Um, at the age of 24, she's the founder of a nonprofit, an educator, a community role model recognized with awards and accolades, and a prolific artist. Her work ranges from painting murals, mixed media, chalk, to installation and performance through which she examines the effects of gun violence, drugs, wealth disparity, and capitalist greed. In 2020, she's garnered attention for her sidewalk chalk murals of healthcare workers during the COVID-19 pandemic. And she recently created a chalk mural at KMAC Museum. Stewart's most recent installation featured a projection on Louisville Metro Hall, featuring a painting entitled, Say Her Name, See Her Face, Justice for Breonna Taylor. And in August of 2019, her installation, God Rest America, converted the white walled garage space at Scheherazade Gallery um, into a growing memorial modeled after the kind of street side memorials often created by community members at sites of violence. She provides free art education to thousands of disadvantaged youth through her nonprofit at a school of art. So thank you, Jalen, for being here. Thank you for having me. I appreciate you all being here. Um, so I wanted to start off by um, asking each of you if you could go through and share an example from your work about the ways that art and culture can impact positive social change. Um, and I don't know if anybody is eager to go first or mm -hmm. if you want me to just kind of call it as you're on my screen or something. Let's see, um, Jalen, you're the first one up on my screen. How about you go first? Um, so one of my most recent projects, it was, well, I think it was my most historical project um, that kind of touches right on what we're doing. It will be my installation that I, my painting and installation that I did of Breonna Taylor. Um, that was something I felt like that um, people all over the world um, 
could relate to or understand exactly what was going on. Um, you know, it talks about topics and different things, gun violence and just the injustice of the um, system, you know, in the United States. Um, and it talks, you know, people were fighting, uh, protesting during this time. And I think that this was an event that really gathered people in a way um, that some, some art cannot, you know. And um, I think that I was able to communicate to people all over the world with this piece. And um, so that's the one. <laughs> I can go next. <laughs> um, so recently, uh, along the around the same time as Jalen, um, I started making art around, um, for example, one of the um, pictures that I edited said when he called for his mom and y'all didn't expect us. And it's a picture of me and another mom. Um, and we became like really active at the time of um, Breonna Taylor's death. And, you know, people, whenever they think of moms, you know, they may not exactly expect a 24 year old college student, but whenever we heard that call, we took it very seriously. And so it was, um, it's amazing how art has the ability to wrap our lived experiences into this package to be presented to other people who may not have the same experiences. And I feel like that this summer um, with a series of pictures that um, I was editing before I even started doing anything else, those alone were deeply rooted in our culture and um, were just on many layers trying to get people to think about who are, who are our moms like that we're calling on. We always depend on our black women, especially. And so, yeah, those are thoughts I just was trying to incite and also like raise money for people who were protesting at the same time. Thank you. Yeah, great. I love what you both said about gathering people and about, you know, those deeply rooted images. Um, let's see, Daniel or, or Representative Booker, who wants to go next? After you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, I actually wanted to hear all of the the artists and creatives. Um, I'm here to soak up a lot of this because I, I like to call myself a creative. Um, and now my medium is um, the halls of government. Um, I, in, in Hood to the Holler, my organization, um, art and expression in all different mediums is like really central. Um, I believe in the power of storytelling and art is, is a vital and central way of doing that. Um, and then of course, I come from a, a family of ministers. And so the ability to um, not only give a message, but to inject the emotion, um, tell the story, build a narrative, um, add music, add dance, you know, it is all really um, important when you're trying to drive a vision and bring people in. Um, one example that I was thinking of listening to everyone um, that, I'll, that I'll share is um, a moment where I think I made some history. I don't, I don't know if this has been done by anyone else, uh, but while I was in the state legislature, um, I, would, I rose on the House floor to speak about um, legislation for permitless concealed carry. Um, and I wanted to express what legislation that restricts um, safety around firearms means to communities like mine. And I wanted to do it in a way that caused people to listen differently. Cause you know, when you talk about guns and second amendment um, in, in Kentucky about places, folks go in their corners, they stop listening. And so on this day, when I got up to speak, I actually acted out, um, I, I acted out a skit. And I talked through um, what it would be like for someone like me to encounter law enforcement once this law was in effect. And um, I acted out my being shot myself. And the, the pain that I, that I emoted, um, it was deeper than me just saying what this bill meant. I showed them. And the bill still passed, but after 
we left the chambers. I had several legislators from across Kentucky, rural parts of Kentucky, um, that came to me and told me they never thought of it that way because they were able to see me getting shots because of this legislation. And um, so I just go back to the, the fact that art isn't just some ancillary thing that we should bring along the way. It's center, it, it is integral to um, our, our push for change because it's the way we tell our stories, the way we express um, our feelings and our vision. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, I keep, my, my mouse keeps moving off the um, mute button. <laughs> um, Daniel, do, would you like to share? Sure, yeah, I think um, as far as a specific example goes, um, I would hope that there are some, although you, I guess as a, as a musician who doesn't tour a lot anymore, doesn't play a lot of, year um, it's kind of hard to measure it in terms of my own specific work but if you think about um, something that we all love and something that connects um, connects to our hearts and souls really deeply is just songs and you hear um, you know you hear songs that are written by people who who live other lives and have other experiences maybe they're in different countries maybe they're in your country but in a different part of the country or a different uh, subculture, and you know, you can you can relate, you can empathize with people through music, um, and you can hear stories and be connected to stories and histories that you may not have lived yourself. And I think every songwriter, even um, well, I don't want to say every songwriter because some people are just trying to write hits and and um, you know find the charts or whatever. But I think most songwriters really, at the core of what they're doing, they want to connect with people and they want to uh, share experiences and, and process experiences with people. Um, I know I've certainly wanted that and I, it's a, something that I want when I write and when I make a record and, um, and hopefully it's been successful. But it's, you know, it's, hard to t it's hard to tell. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. And the, the threads are, are weaving between everything that, that you all are, are saying here. Um, somebody just posted in the, the Q&A here, um, just saying, Representative Booker, how wonderful to know that you use art as a tool to communicate your points, very refreshing. So I just wanted to share that, that comment um, that was shared there. Um, I think uh, the, the comments that you all were making lead me to, to one um, thought that I had in thinking about all of this and actually a quote from another artist from our community. Um, I One of the only live music that I've seen recently was Ben Salee did a concert at Mount St. Francis. It was all distanced and outside back in the fall. And he said something which really struck me and I know I've heard in multiple ways from different people, but um, he said data and science are fantastic for wrapping our heads around things, but the arts are how we wrap our hearts around them. And I think that speaks a lot to what a lot of you are saying in, um, in your answers and the examples that you're sharing. Uh, but one thing that made me think about is the pairing of data and science with art and how especially right now, we have this critical need for data and, and facts out there, but also for creating personal meaning. Um, and I, I wonder if, any, if you have thoughts about how we can pair date, things like data and science with the arts in order to try and achieve both at the same time. Um, if there's any thoughts on that that come to mind with, with you guys or, or thoughts that you've put toward doing that or, um, examples um yeah go ahead um sorry i saw i saw daniel's hand raise and then yeah yeah just just a quick um you're talking about meaning and i think i think that's the crisis that we face as a as a nation as a as a, as a human race because there's there's no shortage of information some of it's good some of it's junk um but i think the reason that people are drawn to the lesser quality information is 
a lack of meaning, a, a, like a, a lack of substance in the broader culture. You know, if, if you don't have a strong sense of, of who you are, where you are, why it's important to care about your neighbors and why it's important to think about how what you're doing and how what other people are doing affects the community, affects everyone, every generation, then what do you have? I mean, you're just like a bunch of consumers buying garbage nobody needs that's poisoning the rivers. You know, it's just, I think that the deep crisis that we face is is a crisis of meaning and a crisis of, of connection um, more than a crisis of data. I mean, there's more data now than ever. You know, it's like, um, you know, it's, it's almost, even the, even the stuff that's real, it's almost too much to handle. You know, like it's a um, hundred years ago, you didn't know five minutes after there was an earthquake on the other side of the world that all kinds of people were suffering. But now you know that and you know all the terrible things that happened on the, the other continent and the other city. And it's like, you're just, we're just sort of bombarded. It's like hard to find a way through the tragedy and the noise and, and to figure out what to focus on. You know, it's, Anyway, I, I think it's ultimately a crisis of meaning more than data. No, that's a really great point. Yeah, I appreciate that. Jalen, did you have something you wanted to share? Yes. Um, as an artist, you know, it, it's, to some people it may sound off, but data is essential when it comes to my work. Data is so important because I consider myself a realist. And uh, when I first started sharing some of my artwork, a lot of my artwork rev revolved around um, gun violence. So I would, you know, go online and I would look at the, you know, public data to see, you know, open homicide cases, you know, cases that have been solved, cases that are still being worked on. And not even just with the victims of violence, just um, any, you know, my chalk or anything that uh, was including COVID or different things like that. And the reason why I say that it's essential and important to me is because Art, you know, is really used as a tool to communicate. You know, we talked about storytelling. We talked about gathering people. But art is, I, this is the reason why I love art so much. You really can use art to manipulate people's mind. You can get, you know, you can have them focus on one thing and they not even realize until after, you know, they studied and spent time with this artwork that you're telling them something. You may be teaching people something, you know. Um, you know, a lot of facts and, and there's a lot of emotion that goes into artwork as well. So I think, you know, science and art is really head on. Um, both of them are used to, you know, change the world and gather people. And um, I've gotten a lot that, you know, when I've created different pieces of artwork and not even just do paintings, um, for example, God Rest America. That was a piece of artwork that really um, touched a lot of people, but it informed people. Um, a lot of people don't know what roadside and, you know, street side memorials are. Um, so a lot of people, you know, were, you know, were grateful and thankful to be able to see something that is so common to me, you know, in my neighborhood and, and people that, um, you know, may live the same, you know, life as me or come from the same background for people that have never seen that in their life, you know, and, and be able to be aware of what's going on in other places outside of what they see every day. So I think both of them are very important. Um, and like they coincide with each other. So. I agree um, exactly with what Jalen's saying. Um, you know, people forget that if you look at the snowflakes, that each of those are individual, that there are no two snowflakes that are the same. And so nature has its own natural way of presenting art as well as it does data and facts. But I also really urge people to think about how their own lived experience is indeed science. Um, people really like to quantify everything, you know, how many um, like homicides take place in this time during this year. But um, as a women gender studies major, I was like really in, in tune with Bell Hook's work where she really expresses that our lived ex experience is as much science as what you could find in a science book but people just don't put our experiences out there the same way. And I feel like that is where art kind of steps in. Art allows people to be able to, ex to share their lived experiences, but to do so in a way that may not look like science. It may not look like data and, and like statistics and things like that, but indeed 
that's what it is. So every day, whenever people are expressing themselves to me, that's another aspect of science and that's another aspect of art. I love that example that you use, you know, that our life is science. That's so true. You know, we can learn and teach each other so much just from our own experiences. So, you know, just provides different insight to people. People don't even realize, you know, there's so many different forms of art and art has helped us through so much, especially this year, you know, this Zoom meeting is a form of art. It's a form of communication, you know, so watching TV, reading a book, walking down the street is all forms of art and all things, you know, that can help us realize what's part of the bigger picture. Mm-hmm. That is so true. I, I just want to add to um, what these incredible, brilliant creatives um, have um, shared, which I wholeheartedly believe. I mean, I, I feel like art is the way to bring science to life and and to light. Um, it's it's a way to capture an event, um, a number, a data point, an emotion. Um, and and present it in a way that can be received um, and taken in from a lot of different access points. Um, and from my work, not only with Hood to the Holler and trying to tell stories about how we can come together across racial geographical divides, which needs a lot of creative energy to help people see it differently, because we're used to seeing our divides and, 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 and ingesting racism in a certain way which means we have allowed these barriers to be built up and we're just used to them. So art is a way to disarm that. And it's also important for on my political side, you know, I've done a lot of campaigns. And one of the most important things for me, um, I'm not gonna speak for every other elected official, but for me is to make every word count and make it land and like connect with your, your heart and your spirit. And so if I'm talking about gun violence and Jalen knows about my family like my I keep my dog tag and my cousin TJ with me and when I show the dog tag and I talk about why I'm standing up to address the public health crisis of gun violence um, it, it just resonates differently than you than just having a position and so I, I and I've actually worked with Ben and you know, we, we've had events where, like with Hood to the Hollow, we had a music fest um, last year. We're going to do it again this year. It's called Which Side Are You On? So they're taking from that spirit of protest and energy, even going going back to the fight for labor and, and, and minors that were taking the stand. And then, of course, um, the stand that we've been taking for Brianna and even before her life was snatched away from us. And we used music and artists from across Kentucky, across the country, to connect to the spirit of what democracy means. Because it's more than just voting. Like voting is just, it's a part you have to do because it is it is a way to help mobilize and activate the democratic process, but it is just one art. And the bigger work of organizing and having a mission and a vision and an agenda requires us to build coalitions and tell stories and move hearts and lift up truth. And art does that. Got a snap to that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, fabulous. Yeah, and we're we're getting snap shared in the the mm-hmm. chat, which some of you guys can see too, and in the um, the Q and A, um, we just had a comment of this group is so open minded and very exciting. I expected a political conversation, but this is so much more. If only we could keep our exchanges on this level of intersectionality, we could finally grow strong. So thank you guys. Um, there's another um, question in the Q&A, which ties in with something I was going to ask about and, and something that Representative Booker was just speaking about in his work, too, of um, that idea of um, the, the divides and how we reach our community and beyond. Um, in the question in the Q&A is, um, as someone that lost a dear friend due to the socialized injustice, how do you hope your art and vision impacts our local community as well as reaching beyond, um, which is what I was thinking about too in terms of these perceived divides that Representative Booker was just talking about and assumptions that we make about um, others. And um, how can how can we help break down 
those assumptions more. So, um, so the idea of how do you hope your art, your vision, your work impacts our local community as well as reaching beyond. Um, does anybody wanna jump on that one? Jalen? Um, my, I really hope that it um, inspires people really to um, take a stand and speak up for things and really things that they may have not been the, you know, bravest to do. I also really, you know, I hope my work affects, you know, people and reaches people in a way um, just to make them look at things a lot different um, and, and be open um, to different situations, to different people, to different stories, to different lives, you know, to different backgrounds. Um, you know, when I first started my artwork and my mission, um, people would often ask me, why do you paint so many victims of violence? Why do you continue to do this. This is such a sad topic. This is such, you know, but this is something that people like, I don't even want to say people like me, people all over the world deal with every day. Violence is everywhere. Violence is, and I don't like to say, but it's, it's such a common thing in some people's lives. And a lot of people don't realize that. So when they see me painting these portraits over and over, I'm creating a legacy, you know, um, making these people more than just a number, you know, this is not the 33rd homicide, you know, of the month or of the year, this is really honoring someone's life and, and, and telling a story that may not often be told, you know, and, and just that alone can really inspire and help a, a family, a, a grieving family, you know, communities and neighborhoods. So that's you know, some ways. Yeah, I think uh, piggybacking off of Jalen, you know, I think a lot of artists hope that our art, not only um, that you get the feeling that we have, but people are able to connect to each other with similar experiences. And, you know, like for me and my art, I hope that people see me as an artist and then can are able to see themselves as artists. Because for a while, I even struggled with calling myself an artist. I was like, I don't know, you know, I do some art. But I started to realize the impact I was having on people. And I realized, wow, that I can say, even though I, you know, may look this way or may do things this way, um, I still have a story to tell. And I can choose how I want to say it through whichever medium of art I choose to do so. And I just hope that empowers people to do and be themselves. Absolutely. I, I would um, I would add um, that it is I think the hope would be openness and um, and just to foster a sense of community across um, across differences you know and, and and to help each other be more compassionate and to understand each other better um, and then there's also just you know I think a lot of a lot of art is necessarily a little bit selfish because you know you don't um, paint by committee. Um, we don't <laughs> sit around and, and vote on what the next word in the song is going to be. Um, so I think for the individual artist, it can be um, a way of processing what's going on in the community, but with the hope ultimately of, of creating that connection. Agree, 100%. I, I, um, I just want to say how humbled I am to be a part of this with you all. Um, thank you all for your work. You know, I, I'm really, I'm really solemn and reflecting now because, you know, my, my hope um, is really just building on what you all were saying is that um, we can find the power of love in art and we can find um, the inspiration um, to, to dig deeper, to push harder, to shine brighter because of um, what art does and what it, what it means and what it can communicate and how it can bring us together and help us see one another. Um, it was really, it was hard for me. It was hard, but it wasn't because I, I know who I am. I, I, I am who I am everywhere I go, but um, going all over Kentucky in spaces where, you know, there were publications about me you know, call me the N-word and um, places where there's like a history of overt racism and showing up in my authentic self to tell my story and 
as a Kentuckian, which is our story. Um, and using everything I learned along the way, you know, drama, music, a little bit of dance, uh, visuals. Um, like I, I was intentionally using all of these tools because we gotta, we have to break through. And there are, there are generations of berries have been built up that we have to chisel away and we got to use every tool in the toolkit. And so um, even this logo behind me for Hood to the Holler, um, I, I wish I could put a, uh, put a logo up, up on the screen so you can see it. It's a circle that's connected. And so Hood and Holler are actually connected. And there are entry points mm -hmm. uh, in both ends where you can get to them. And so they're connected and they are together. Um, and, and the Hood sort of looks like a skyline holler sort of looks like a valley. And, and it was really a way of visualizing the fact that we are together and we're in it together. And so um, my hope is that we can continue to use our art as a powerful tool because it can be used as a weapon too. Um, it can tell a story like the Southern strategy. I'm saying we need a new Southern strategy with what Hood to the Holler is about, but the Southern strategy was essentially weaponizing racism and adding color to fear and hate um, to drive people apart, you know, like welfare queens and like the war on drugs. And like, it was, it was painting the picture to make people fight one another. And art can, art can help us heal that. I just want to say that we're honored to be here with you as well. And especially <laughs> me, I'm just proud to say that I know you. Um, and I'm so grateful that you are saying the things that you are saying because it's so true. A lot of people can't see past our black skin. So we have to pull out every trick in, in the bag in order for them just to listen to us, even if we're just saying hello. You know, they can't get past what we look like, how we walk, how we talk, how our hair is. So it's just so important for us to, to stand up in the way that we are. And I'm just honored to be able to know someone that comes from the same background as I do, that is, you know, fighting, you know, for, for different positions of power to really help change things, you know, beyond art, you know, so I just wanted to say that. Thank you. You, you know, I love you too. <laughs> love all of y'all. <laughs> yeah, we're definitely honored to have you be a part of it and, and all of you, definitely. Um, it's, um, a great conversation and I love the things that you all are saying and we're talking about of, of entry points to to go in and um, you know those those assumptions came up a lot I feel like through this summer with um, the the protests that were happening in Louisville and all over the, the state and not to mention national and international and how they how they went on and and I know you know with Hood to the Holler working in all areas of the state um, and I know Daniel's involved with Kentucky Natural Lands Trust and, and the, the Pine Mountain Collective of artists that work down there in, in Harlan County and, and working to understand and hear each other and, and come to that common um, understanding and, and, and seeing where each other are coming from makes such a huge difference in, in that. Um, I was just checking to see if there are other, I'm not seeing other questions in the Q&A, but all of you who are watching, feel free to, to put those in the, um, the Q&A. Um, there's a few, um, let's see, a few comments in the, the chat, which we can share wider too. Um, looks like just other, um, Feedback. Um, so I wanted to to get back to um, the other portion of um, what we were talking about with the event of the idea of staying involved with the political process. Um, and I know we've talked about that sort of in an abstract, um, you know, sense and talking about the arts involvement with that. But um, are there ways either through your art and, and your work and um, you know, your organizing um, that you specifically work to stay involved with that process or suggestions and advice that you wanna share with um, the attendees that we have here for um, how we can stay involved with um, the political process beyond voting. I love what you said, Representative Booker, about um, you know, voting being the must do, the, you know, the, um, I wrote down how you fit, 
mobilizing and activating the democratic process. But I think we need to mobilize and activate um, in the rest of the year too, um, not just through you know seeing the campaigning, seeing you know deciding how we're going to vote. So um, I don't know if you all would like to to speak about that idea of in, engaging with the political process, um, whether it's pulling in art and culture or not. I mean, it's naturally a part of everything, I think, but <laughs> so. Um, I would. Um, I would really encourage people to get informed about, you know, what does government even mean? Because a lot of times people think of the federal government with uh, neglect to the state or even local government that's happening every day. Um, it wasn't until I decided to get my master's randomly in public administration that I realized how important it was to be involved in our local government. So, for example, right now um, I'm interning with uh, the Catholic Action Center and I'm literally every day watching eviction court um, just to hear um, how people are judging, um, how judges are judging, what people are having to go through in order to get resources that they need uh, and broadcasting the resources out in Fayette County. And I would just encourage people, if there's something that you care deeply about, if you care about not seeing people get out in the cold, if you care about feeding people and that's something that like is uh, like um, very special to your heart, seek out other people in your community who are doing that work because a lot of times they need that extra support um, just even at the local level, because I think it's really easy to get caught up in like CNN or the news stations that are covering what's happening, you know, on that federal national level. But there's things that are happening here that uh, working at food banks, just volunteering and giving your time. And a lot of things are on Zoom now. So, you know, we're all at home anyway. So, you know, go attend court and just watch and see what's happening and see how people are, what people are having to go through to just stay in their house. To me, it's very humbling. And it also gets me fired up to be like, okay, so what can I do to help make sure that people are staying in their house? What can I do to help make sure people have food? What can I do to make sure that people are getting the health care that they need? I agree with you 100%. I think that um i have a few things <laughs> a few ways i feel like it's uh helpful number one is listening um we don't know what the problem is we don't know what to fix we don't know if we are not listening to each other um and this is kind of also number two is chiming back into what we recently talked about research we need to know what the problem is you know we need to know yes. even our problems and uh number three i i feel like is being consistent with whatever it is that you are trying to change, whether, you know, what, whether it's through art, you know, political, any, any type of way is being consistent because we are living in a world <laughs> where everything is a trend, you know, it comes and it goes so quickly, but when it comes to such heavy topics and, and things that deal with people's everyday lives, we, we don't have a lot of people that we feel like is is fighting continuous continuously, and when we see people give up, it's almost like you give up on everything, and that just becomes a natural and common thing to do because nobody else is fighting for it. Nobody they stop, you know. I, why should I keep going? And um, teaching <laughs> what you learn, share with other people. You never know who you can influence. You never know who you can help. So um, I think those are always to stay involved, always to influence. Um, and I think those are all, they're selfless ways to stay involved, you know. Um, I th the, so yeah, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry <with> those words. <laughs> no, thank you, that was great. Um, others, you wanna? Um, I think artists are, um, are at the end of the day just citizens like everybody else and but so much of what we do has to do with communicating and especially as time goes on um, and if we're fortunate we develop more of a following you know we we can make more and more work and it's seen in more and more places and we're meeting more and more people and, and participating in events like this and I think um, I think it's important to uh, be consistent as you said, and to remember that um, 
sometimes it is our job just to make something, whatever beautiful thing that we're thinking of, you know, make, if we want to paint a picture of a landscape or if we want to write a love song or whatever, that's, that's great. Um, and we should do that. Absolutely. Because that's, um, you know, part of our calling as, as a, as an artist or a musician or a poet or whatever. But I think it's also really important and it's almost, um, impossible to avoid putting things that are a little bit weightier and heavier and maybe even more important in our work because we are citizens and and most of the artists i know are among the most curious and inquisitive and um well-read and just generally fascinated people and you know we we want to learn about what's going on good or bad and and so it's going to seep into the work. And I think it's important to be mindful of that and to, to foster that. And, and even though um, it may not always be uh, commercially viable, um, to ignore that as much as we can and, and do what we know we need to do. Good points. Thank you. All right. I don't well, you, you know, I, Go ahead. you know, I have a lot about getting politically involved. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yo, let's have this conversation, shall we? Um, <laughs> I, what, what I mentioned earlier, um, when I was talking about voting, like we have to vote um, because, like, that's that's like the starting point, and and, and in a lot of ways, um, a way to capture the endpoint. Um, but the truth that we all know. Um, in a lot of cases, we are voting to minimize the harm and not necessarily to um, advance the, the dramatic structural change that we need. And and I won't be very clear for me, we need system level change. Like it, and, and for me, that means pulling up the roots of racism. It means ending poverty. And, and I think, I know that won't happen without art. We won't get there without art because we, art is the vehicle. Like it's, it's the, it's the convener. Um, it's the storyteller. It's it's the data sharer. It you no, know, it's it's all of that. Um, listening to to these creatives, which I, I love sort of going last, because I get to listen to everybody. Is there were a couple of words that sort of bubbled up for me outside of voting, as far as if you're looking for ways to stay involved as creative, as a citizen, as a human being. Um, first, I'll plug Hood to the Holler. I really hope y'all connect with me. Spe all the creatives, because. Like I said, we have to go at the heart of what is holding Kentucky back and our country back um, in more ways than just having a point and being right about it. Like we got to connect with folks and we, we have to lift the truth up um, in ways that people um, can take in and meet them where they are. It forces them to think, be introspective and, and art. We, we got to do that. So please, let's work together. But in addition to voting, um, I wanted to drop some words, I'm stealing from y'all, so because that's why I went last. Um, organizing, of course, uh, which I'll come back to. Education, that, as was mentioned, networking, training, um, advocacy, so lobbying, citizen lobbyists, not corporate lobbyists, um, and organizing again. Art is infusing all of that. I mean, even Hood to the Hollow, like the name. At first, I didn't want to call it that because I was like, well, you know, how are folks going to feel about it? Like, is it it's like, is it too hood, <laughs> you know? And mm -hmm. and it was a call and response. Like I would say from the hood to the, and folks say holler. Like it was a call and response. Like me growing up in the church and you know, that, that theme of music, that theme of cadence. And I was like, it has to be called that. And, and so art even informed why it's that name. Um, and no justice, no peace. Like we say that in the cadence in which we say it is music to the movement. And now it's actually a song. And, you know, and so um, all throughout the process of making democracy mean something, there are ways to get involved. Um, we're doing voter registration. We're gonna announce a statewide campaign. We need creatives to help capture why voting is important and to the point of like what elected offices mean. Like when I was running for state house, a lot of folks didn't even know what, what a state representative does. And what does that role do to perpetuate and or end poverty? And we have to creatively tell folks and show folks and bring them into why their power in, in uh, effecting that office is so important. So um, hoodtothehollow.org, 
Uh, mm -hmm. We're doing organizer trainings. We're doing political trainings for folks who want to run for office, boards and commissions. And I am especially um, asking all creatives. I hope Brianna's on here. She's so dope. If she is, I'm giving her some love um, to, to connect with me as well so that we can lift up your work nationally and in other ways. Because um, like I said, that's the key. Thank you all. Um, I want to share a couple of comments, and we've got a couple of questions in the in the Q and A. Um, comments about the um, the idea of local um, that several of you raised, um, and I think this was when Dejan was speaking. Somebody commented that she's exactly on point. Local elected officials affect everything we do. We need to watch and hold them accountable. Um, and some thanks from from folks for. Um, the conversation, I wanna thank you all. You've broadened my thoughts, which liberates me to make certain that I follow my heart and take action. Don't just sit on the sidelines. So you're reaching folks. Um, we had one question specifically about um, ideas for younger teens and kids to engage in social justice work. Um, does anybody wanna to speak to that? You got ideas? Um, I work with a lot of kids and I think ways for to, and I, I don't like to say this, but keep them involved. It's our job, it's our duty to make sure that they are involved because they are still kids, because they are still teenagers. Um, but not just really put the pressure on them. I'm, I'm, a, I'm real big on listening, you know, in order to be a good leader, you have to be a good listener. So I think we need to listen to our youth and listen to our teenagers and really find out what it is that they want, what it is that they need in order to get to where it is that we are in our minds, you know, um, to help and get involved. So, um, but there's there's many, many different ways. Of course, there's always programming and different things like that, you know, having them tune in on a conversation just like this is a way for them to be involved. And they and I'm not, they don't have to go out, you know, on the front lines of protesting, you know, and, and do things like that. If they want to, it's, it's perfect. But there's so many other creative ways um, to get them involved. And I, I think those are just, you know, a few. Yeah, I think um, I'm a big sister to nine little, <laughs> little people. And uh, what I've like noticed the most is like, we have to answer their questions. Mm -hmm. Whenever they have questions and it may seem absurd that they're asking this question that came out of their little kid brain or whatever, but you just have to take time to answer it because you never know what that's gonna like act as like a little flicker that turns into a flaming fire for them that will like stir up their creativity whenever they get that answer. So I think whenever you A, listen and then answer the questions that come along from listening and then tell them to be creative and do what they want with the information, process it how you need to process it and get back with me, you know, let's hold our kids accountable. Like, you know, listen to it, listen to me. I need to know you're listening because I work with kids too. I'm like, I need to know you're listening. So what did I say? and bring it back to me the way that you want to, not like in the form of an, of an essay or something. But if you want to make a little rap to it, you know, go ahead, I'll listen, I'll, I'll clap my hands at the end. But I think we just got to be open to however they want to present themselves. All right, Daniel, I was going to defer to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, because I just keep wanting to hear y'all creative stuff. I, I think um, just sort of, I'm thinking about my daughters. So I have a 13 year old, five year old. And you know, the way our society is structured, um, it's really easy to block out creativity. You know, we get so focused on how busy we are, um, how much money we need to make, um, the struggles that we're facing. And like when you come from a struggle, like it can be hard to feel like you have the time or the space to be creative or to make art but the truth of the matter is we're doing it. Like we're, we're doing it all along. Um, I'm even thinking personally, but there were times I didn't feel like I had the agency or, or that it was actually art. And so I think paying attention to um, our, our youth and, and celebrating what they create because they are already creating art um, and, and respecting their agency and their space to be creatives, which was building on what, um, was said you know before and um i think the the other thing that 
we should do, and I, I'm, I'm trying to lead by example, is um, like centering um, our youth and not, not just as a box to, to check off um, in like leadership or in politics. You know, people say, well, we need to have young people involved, but they don't really mean it. Um, we have the opportunity, particularly through creativity, um, to, to center young voices um, in a way that is impactful and elevates them. Like I think about the inauguration with um, Amanda Gorman, I believe it's her last name. Like she was the inauguration. She was the inauguration. I mean, there, I mean, now there was some barriers being broken. First woman, um, black Asian American, Amanda was the inauguration. And it was her being able to capture the whole spirit and history of where this nation is and put it in everybody's face that let me know, okay, we gonna, we'll we be all right. We got a lot of work to do, but we'll be okay. And so centering uh, youth voices. Mm -hmm. um, kind of a related, potentially, um, or Daniel, did you have anything you wanted to jump in there? I had to run, our, our daughter was uh, having a bit of a meltdown. <laughs> I, I'm not actually sure where we are in the conversation. It's okay. We were actually, um, someone had asked in the Q&A about um, suggestions for getting youth involved with social justice. Um, so as a, with your, with your kids um, and, and youth in general, if you have any thoughts on that, you're welcome to share or we can give you a minute to soak back in and go on if you. Just quickly, I would say um, education and, and music and just teaching kids to care about the world and, and to care about other people. Because I think if you, if you do that, if you care about the world and other people, like um, the rest of it, it's gonna come naturally. You're gonna want justice. You know, you're gonna work for peace. Um, you're gonna work for equity. So just starting it, just a general, just love in general, I think is, is a good place to start with that. Mm -hmm. Please pardon the crying. That's okay. <laughs> it's a very cranky baby who uh, who uh, does not want to go to bed, but it's very tired. <laughs> you hear those kiddos? <laughs> um, well, there was another question shared in the Q and A um, that uh, this this um, attendee said. I agree that art is critical to educate, but Kentucky, while it appreciates the arts, does not find it as well as it could. Um, what does the state legislature propose or suggest a realistic budget increase for the arts? Um, I don't know if that's maybe addressed to, more to you, Representative Booker, but I'm sure everybody has thoughts on funding for the arts um, and how that connects to our ability to get in there and, and make change. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to, to go first. Um, yeah, I mean, that that is one of the biggest battles that we have in Frankfurt is not only supporting education, particularly public education, but um, enhancing the arts and investing in, in the arts. Because there are a lot of, um, a lot of folks that are in elected office that see that as like something you do when you have extra time. Um, or, you know, oh, that's nice, but let's get down to, to business. And which is why we have to be in those spaces to push back and to add clarity and truth to, wait a minute, you're missing the whole essence of why, what we're trying to do when we provide opportunities for education for our children. We're trying to give them uh, the tools and the space to grow and to thrive and dream and to excel. And you don't do that without art, like you, you don't. Um, and I, I do think that um, with Governor Bashir and a, a Lieutenant Governor who is an educator, um, I've had this conversation with her I think we have um, support in the executive that we haven't seen in a while. Um, so that gives me a little bit of hope that we can begin to advocate for budgetary increases. Um, but we got our work cut out. I'm not in Frankfurt anymore, but like my stress level is. And um, that's one of the reasons why um, I'm trying to help folks become organizers, like relational organizers, so that we can tell more people about why we should push on them to invest in arts and increase um, the budget, but we have an ally in the executive and we have a growing coalition of folks. So we, we just got to lean into that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Anybody else want to share or I was thinking too, Daniel, you kind of did the flip with Pine Mountain Sessions. You used the arts to create funding for an organization working toward environmental justice. So you want to speak to Yeah, I think I think that's one thing that we can do um, is um, try to use our work to connect people with things that we care about or that we value. Um, and so, yeah, you know, just mounting a fundraiser for an organization or for um, for a cause, I think, can be pretty effective. Especially, you know, I think most artists, if you ask, are always up for doing that. You know, um, I think too, as just as people who love art, aside from the fact that it's something that we make, um, support artists that you love. You know, just. Uh, if you love an illustrator, reach out to them via their website and say, hey, I'd love to buy one of your illustrations, or I would love to um, buy one of your paintings, or do you have anything small that I could afford? Because, you know, most, a lot of our work is, is sort of unaffordable for, for most people. Um, but do you have like a, a, you know, an edition of prints that are only like 20 bucks and I, can I get one? Or if you love a musician, buy their album or an author or poet by their book, you know, that's, it's not institutional level funding, um, but it really matters. I mean, it, I think, you know, the, all of us on here could probably speak to how important that is when somebody buys one of our pieces, how much of a big difference that makes um, to our income and, and livelihood. I, I hope, and it would be great if the United States and, and Kentucky were to um, fund the arts at a level that a lot of other countries do. I, I'm not going to say that I don't think it's going to happen because I, I'd love for it to happen and I'm happy to work for, for it to happen. But if history is any indication, especially given the budgetary crises that are from coast to coast, I think it's going to, for a while at least, fall on us as people who love art to make sure that artists are are earning a living. Um, so, so yeah, if you like it, support it. Patreon, mm -hmm. ask your favorite artist what their PayPal is and send them 10 bucks. I mean, just whatever, whatever it is, I, I think, um, I think that's probably a more effective strategy, at least in the short term. Um, but just a thought. And lastly, like piggybacking off of that, just like you would tell your artists that you care about art, I think it's um, really important to also tell your legislation the things that you care about to seek out your representatives and let them know like, I care about art. And if you're representing me, I feel like that you should know that. And whenever you just like look up your representatives on Google, it's very easy to contact them. You can like do anything from send them letters, write them emails, just call, leave a message and just tell them what you think is important because even though you may seem like it does, it may seem like it doesn't make an impact. At least you know that your voice got out there. Mm -hmm. And I, I know Jalen's about to, to go. I, I don't want to take any time for her. I just want to echo as a legislator, it does matter. Like they, you may not hear a response from every one of them, but when we go into caucus, they talk about all the emails and calls that they got. And I'm telling y'all now, if, if you want to advocate for more budgetary funding at state or local level or federal, I think we got a good chance to get some more federal money considering the, the leadership changes in Congress. Um, you can contact the members on the education committee, or if you are thinking outside of the box with art and you're doing, um, similar like Daniel, and you're trying to advocate for environmental issues, you can contact the Natural Resources Committee. I can help you all if you're trying to do that. Um, that would be, a, it's a powerful tool and it makes a difference. It really does. Um, <laughs> artists get it really hard when it comes to funding and paying us. Um, I, I think that every artist can agree with that. Um, I know when I was younger, I never wanted to be an artist. Like no matter how talented I was, I didn't want to be an artist because I was always told that artists don't make a lot of money. You need a backup plan. 
um, but art is where my heart is. Um, I think it's so important for people to support artists because that's the way we survive. Um, and not only, you know, that's the way we survive financially, but it's, it's just a part of our sanity. You know, I know I, in order, I need art to survive. <laughs> I need to have a way to express myself. But some days I realize, you know, especially early on in my art career, and I know it's just the beginning, but I realized how much of myself that I was giving to other people and I don't want to say not getting anything in return, but not really get my coins, you know, <laughs> to make a living for myself. You know, I still have to come home every day to take care of family, um, take care of myself, um, you know, and just just make a everyday living. So it's, it's very important to uh, support and fund arts and artists in particular. Um, and, and people don't realize that you all require a lot from artists <laughs> and, and not paying us is, is like. It's, it's, it's borderline disrespectful. It's like going to work for 40 hours a week and you don't get a paycheck for all the work that you've done, you know? Um, so it's, look at it along those lines as well. We're not just sitting in a studio painting pretty pictures. I know I'm giving my entire heart, everything that I know about life, you know, to other people through my arts. And that's, like I said, it's the way we make our living. So it's just important, um, you know, to support us in any way that you can, small, large, whatever, so. Thank you so much. Um, well, I think um, we've got one more question in the, in the Q&A, which um, might be a, a good way to, to wrap up, um, unless any of the panelists have anything else you want to bring up or anything like that. Um, but one of our um, ballot box artists who's, who signed in asked if you each could share what's next for each of you. So what's, what's on the horizon next for each one of our panelists, if you guys want to share a bit more. Um, I, I do so much. Last year was so busy for me. I finally am in a space where not really, but I get to breathe a little bit and kind of get to choose what I want to be next. I really want to do a show in 2021. I, uh, last year, I spent a lot of time um, doing out, you know, outdoor murals and different things like that. So hopefully, you know, this pandemic will soon come to an end and I can really get people back in a gallery or a museum to really display a different body of work, something I like to switch things up, <laughs> like to put my hand in a lot of different pots. So I just want to create something new, something refreshing. Um, so, you know, still kind of works. I'm still deciding. <laughs> understand all right who who else got to I'll, I'll go um it's funny i'm sure i'm sure a lot of people are asking what am i gonna be doing next um, <laughs> so, <laughs> um well with hood to the holler we got the voter registration campaign that's gonna kick off y'all will be seeing um info about that soon because that's gonna be statewide and i need y'all's help um, we have political training. Um, applications are open now. It's free. Um, you do have to apply, though. It's with Arena Academy, a national partner. We're bringing training to folks across Kentucky who want to run for office and get involved in campaigns. Um, I'm also working on a, a book, a memoir about um, my work across Kentucky and my story from the West End, I'm doing a documentary. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of creativity in my world all the time. And um, I'm evaluating what's next for me politically too. I know some of y'all probably wondering. Uh, you'll hear about that soon too. Okay. <laughs> Everybody will be on the edge of their seats. <laughs> All right, uh, Dejan, do you have anything you wanna share? Oh my gosh, about my next steps. Oh my goodness. I, <laughs> I was like, no, let me go last. Oh no, <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, I am trying to merge my two loves of, of art and policy into something. And um, I've, I've been thinking about doing maybe something along the lines of community organizing, but I've also kind of thought of, um, it may take the shape of uh, something like more community programming or something like that. Uh, I really don't know what I'm doing. I just dabble in so many different things and I'm just allowing God to use me and wherever the, them steps may take, they will take me to where I need to go, I'm sure. <laughs> I think that's a, that's a 
we get a pass for that as artists because some days we wake up and it's just there some days we're like i don't know (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah, literally (laughs) (laughs) yeah all right daniel you want to share anything sure yeah i've got um things have been a little slow um through the you know the covid lockdowns um not, not really playing any shows or we had a we had a lot of events scheduled in 2020 with um the kentucky natural lands trust and pine mountain um record around the record and artists and different shows all across the state and those obviously all got canceled which was um you know in the grand scheme of things not that big a deal but which was kind of kind of a bummer but we're hoping that maybe by the end of this year we can do some more events um and certainly in 2022 if God willing, um, mm-hmm. but it, more immediately, I'm I'm working on finishing a record that I started a really long time ago, maybe two years ago. It's been uh, it's been a very slow process um, for all kinds of reasons, but I'm about halfway finished with the new album, and uh, and uh, about a month ago, <clears throat> I started pre-production on a on a record that's. Um, it's, it's a tribute album to an artist I really love. He's actually a dear friend. His name is Seth Kaufman, who records under the name Floating Action. And um, he's based in North Carolina. And just for the most beautiful records, really fun, great songs, great music, um, and a wonderful musician. And so I'm in the process of kind of bringing together a bunch of different artists who he's worked with in the past and friends of his to, to make a tribute to his music and his songwriting. That's been that's been a lot of fun. I've, it's been uh, it's been great to connect with folks and get that going. If you're not familiar with his work, um, Floating Action is the name of the band. And uh, it's uh, it's good stuff. Nice. Well thank you. I'm sure everybody's gonna be watching to see what um you guys to do next. This has been a really fabulous conversation. Um, I want to thank all of our panelists for spending the evening with us and um, everybody who joined in um, online to to participate too. Um, And of course, Skylar and Keith and Kristen from LVA, it's been great to partner with you all and be able to to host Ballot Box at, at 21C.